Loving Father, we thank you and we praise you, O Lord, for this beautiful and wonderful evening that once again you have given us the opportunity to gather together to listen to your word. Lord, you have said in today's gospel to cast all our cares, all our burdens unto you and you will give us rest. Lord, we know and we believe, Lord, that you are with us every moment of our life. And so we have nothing to fear. Even when the storm comes or problems or situations arise in our life, Lord, we believe and we know and know that you are there and you have promised to carry each one of our burdens as long as we cast them unto you and remain in perfect rest. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your word that always encourages us, strengthens us, comforts us, directs and guides us in our walk with you. Today, as we listen to your word, open our spiritual eyes, help us to understand every word that is spoken. May the words that are spoken today bear abundant fruit in our lives and help us to apply this word every moment of our life. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Brothers and sisters, a warm welcome to each one of you. As I mentioned to you in the introduction, today we are going to reflect on the day's gospel from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. And today, while we go into the last three verses of Matthew chapter 11, we shall see that what Jesus said yesterday in verses, uh, I believe it is from verses 24 or 25 onwards, Till about, I think it was 25 to 27, what he said yesterday has got so much of a connection to what he's going to tell us today. And you know, my brothers and sisters, before we begin, it is important for us that when we go through the daily gospel, please listen to this very carefully. When we go through the daily gospel and it belongs to the same chapter, you know, it is important for us to understand fully what the previous verses are talking about, especially the context of the verses, so that what we are going to learn today will be able to be assimilated, be able to absorb what we are learning today, and we will be able to get the full understanding because of the context in which Jesus is speaking these words. So yesterday, Jesus was talking about, you know, come to me. Yesterday, he was talking about, you know, uh, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, for revealing the secrets and you know not giving it to the wise and not to the intelligent but revealing them only to a little infants that's what we saw yesterday that is in verse number 25 and today my sister and brothers what we are going to see is something that Jesus is just going to build on on what he said yesterday because it's part of the same discourse it's part of the same teaching that he did and because we are coming from yesterday to today, we are coming after almost 24 hours, we sometimes think that that's a completely new chapter. And therefore, we need to be connected to the word. We need to do the revision of what we learned yesterday so that we are in the flow of that teaching. We are in the flow of what we learned yesterday and we can make that connection and understand what Jesus is speaking to us. So let's go to Matthew chapter 11, verse number 28. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. You know, my brothers and sisters, if some of you who are receiving the daily reflections, which are which you know, which I which I sent out early in the morning. I was I was mentioning in that that you know when we want you know to take rest, especially if we are working, 
you know, if you're working in the office, by the time you come back home, having worked in the office, traveled along the way, you will be physically tired. For you homemakers, especially you mothers who are at home, you have to clean the house, you have to cook the food, you have to do the groceries. And then of course, you have to also worry about all the negative comments that are passed in the house, either from your children or from your spouse. And you know, there's so much happening around. And by the end of the day, we are all tired. We are all weary. And therefore, we need that rest. We need to go to bed. We need to, you know, get rest for our tired muscles. But you know, my brothers and sisters, what is Jesus saying here today? He's saying, come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. So obviously, when Jesus then come to me, he's not talking about a physical rest. You know, he's talking about a rest that we need in our minds. And you know, my brothers and sisters, unless our minds are at rest, we will never be able to experience the peace and the joy and the fruit of the spirit because it's like a tap that is closed. It's not able to allow everything that is in our born again spirits to flow into our soul and to flow into our mind and eventually to flow into our bodies. So yesterday, as I said to you, Jesus, what did he say in verse number 25? He says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. You know, he says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth for, for hiding these things because you have hidden these things from the, from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. That's what he says. And you know, my brother says that these words of Jesus are actually totally against the wisdom of this world. They're totally against the wisdom of this world. You know, people of the world will never think those who are infants can receive any, any, any sort of wisdom or intelligence other than what they required from this world, you know, through their, through their degrees, through their education, through the number of years of their experience. They can never think that, you know, a small child or an infant or somebody who's never gone to school or never got degrees can ever have a lot of, you know, wisdom of God. But you know, my brothers and sisters, now that now according to the world's ways, as I said, the way to success, you know, every time when you think about people of this world, they always think that success is how it's obtained. You have to work very hard. You have to, you have to work your way up to the top. And you know, when you read Romans chapter uh, 8 verses 5 to 7, which we started about a week ago, you know, and we, if it, what we reflected the whole of last week and before, you will see what St. Paul is actually bringing out when he talks about, you know, the people of this world, how they want to work hard and go to the top. I want to take you to Romans chapter 8 verses 5 to 7 because I want to show you exactly what St. Paul was saying. We have already reflected on that, but we are going to look at these verses in context to what Jesus is saying, how only in the spirit, only when we operate according to God's word, we will be able to experience the rest in our minds. Let's read that. Romans chapter 8, verses 5 to 7. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Remember, we are talking about, you know, setting our minds. To set the mind on the flesh is death. And to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. And you know, my brothers and sisters, if you really listen to it and have gone back to the talks, remember, death is not physical death. Depression is death. You know, sickness is death. You know, lack is death. Poverty is death. A poor relationship with our spouse, with our family, with our, in our marriage is death because it's a slow, uh, slow death that is going to simply going to beat us up and totally torture us. Eventually, we are going to have all sorts of problems in our body. So death is not only physical death when you see the person in the coffin, but it is also all these things that the word of God says is death. That when the mind is operating according to the flesh, it's death. But to set the mind on the spirit, to set the mind on the word of God is life and peace. Let us go and see verse number seven. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. 
It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. For this reason, he says, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile towards God. You know, my brothers and sisters, what is the meaning of the mind that is set on the flesh? When the mind is not thinking on the word of God, the mind is, not, is thinking on anything outside the word of God, it is already in the flesh. And that mind, which is not thinking according to the word of God, is going to be hostile to God. It is going to be hostile to the things of God. It cannot submit to the, to the laws of God. In fact, St. Paul says in verse number seven, it cannot. The mind that is not thinking on the word of God cannot. Because just think for ourselves every part of the day. Are we thinking on the word of God? Or are we thinking what somebody said to us? What insulting words we receive from our spouse, from our children, from our boss, from our colleagues, whether we received appreciation or not, or whether we are constantly encouraging ourselves in the word of God. Are we constantly reminding ourselves through the Holy Spirit within us that we are actually children of God, that all that people come against us is only temporary. We are not going to meditate on what they have said. We are only going to focus on that one truth that we are sons, we are daughters of God. And you know, my brothers and sisters, in verse number 28, Jesus was saying, come to me and rest. Come to me and rest. There is a place in Christ, my brothers and sisters, where all we do is simply rest and receive in response to what Jesus has already done for us on the cross. You know, you know, you know, my brothers and sisters, most of the time the world will say, don't worry about what Jesus did. Yes, let us do our part and God will do the rest. That is true to a degree, but you must understand, we simply need to rest and receive what Jesus has already done for us on the cross. You know, you know, my brothers and sisters, if you look into the spiritual world through the, through the word of God, everything has been laid on a buffet for us. The buffet is laid. You don't need to go to the grocery shop. You don't need to go to the kitchen and cook. You don't need to marinate the chicken. You don't need to do anything of that sort in the spiritual realm. It's all cooked and ready for us. All we need to do is believe what Jesus has done and receive it as our birthright. Now, many of you will say, rather that means from today, we are going to stop buying groceries. Are we going to stop cooking and we are only going to operate by faith? Brothers and sisters, that's not exactly what it means. What it really means is when you understand who you are in Christ and you understand that everything that Jesus has, you know, whatever we require in this world is already in the spiritual realm, it is already finished. Now we simply need to rest in the promise of God instead of worrying, you know, instead of worrying, being anxious about what will happen tomorrow, how the money will come, how will I get well? Instead of doing that, we simply need to bring our minds to rest. That's exactly what Jesus is saying. Come to me and rest. You know, I want to take you to the book of Hebrews because that's the only place we can really understand what, you know, the writer of Hebrews is saying. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 3 onwards. Let us go to Hebrew chapter 4 verses 3 onwards because in Hebrew chapter 4 to about Hebrews chapter 4 to 3 to 12 about that, we will begin to see what the writer is saying. Let us read that. Hebrew chapter 4, let's begin with verse number 3. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said, as in my anger I swore, they shall not enter my rest though his works were finished at the foundation of the world. Okay, listen to this, my brothers and sisters. For we who have believed, you know, this is, this is not for everybody. You know, many people will read this verse and they say, why am I not experiencing that rest? The condition is in verse number three, for we who have believed, that word believed is so very important because only those who have been born again those who have accepted Jesus as their Lord, God, and Savior, they have the power within. Their spirits are brand new. Because they believe, they now have Jesus as their Lord, God, and Savior. So the word of God says, for we who have believed enter that rest just as God has said. You know, my brothers and sisters, you know, you know, God rested not because he was tired or because he was exhausted. You know, many people think that, you know, today I worked so hard. I've really had a hard day at work. I've been working in the kitchen. I've been cleaning the house. I've been bringing the groceries. Yes, that's all physical tiredness. You know, that is a physical fatigue that comes to all. But when this verse says, 
just as God rested. You know, it says God rested, but God did not rest because he was tired. God rested because everything that he had to do was already complete. He finished everything. You know, there was nothing for God to do more because he had finished everything that he had to do. It was done perfectly. There was nothing more to do. There was no finishing to be done. Like, you know, if you have, you know, if you go to a house, they put it, they put the plaster on the walls, then they put some lami, then they put some paint, then they do some finishing, then they put the skirting. There is a lot of work to be done. When God did it, he did everything perfectly. Anything more would have made it imperfect because it would have simply spoiled the whole thing. Everything that God did was absolutely perfect. You know, you know my brothers, just to give you an idea, what is the meaning of perfection? You know, it was, it, 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 the, it was a rest like a painter who finishes, you know, a painting and then rests from all his painting. Suppose a painter, say Michelangelo or whoever has done painting. Once he has finished the painting, whatever he had his mind, he has put that on the painting, he has put that on the canvas, he has put that in that particular wall, it's all finished. You know, it's not because he's tired from holding the brush once he has finished the painting. It's because the painting is a masterpiece just the way it is. One more brush, one more stroke of anything will simply ruin the whole painting because it's completely finished. In the same way, my brothers and sisters, God created everything so perfectly that there is nothing more else to do. Everything has been finished. You know, he created all the animals. He created all the plants. He created all the grass. He created everything that was there with the ability inside of those animals and those plants and those fruit trees to, to reproduce, to procreate again. And no, my brothers and sisters, now that he has put, therefore he doesn't have to create any more animals or create any more plants every day to replace the ones that are dying. That, that is not what God does. He has already finished everything. You know, he built this ability to reproduce into every living thing. That's exactly the reason. You know, from one seed, Adam and Eve, today you have the whole human race. You mean to say he's going and producing everybody, every human being every day? There are so many children who are being born. That's because of the seed of Adam and Eve. Through the seed of the husband, through the egg of the wife, there is just a reproduction taking place by brothers and sisters. God has never done more than creating anything in the natural realm. Ever since 2000 years, God has stopped creating anything. Whatever he had to do at the time of creation, he has finished everything. He is simply resting in what he has already done. And therefore, brothers and sisters, if God is already resting in what he has done, there is nothing more for God to do. He is now resting because whatever he had to finish, he has already finished with the ability of that person or the human being all those plants, all those animals from within to reproduce and to create new ones. Let's go to verse number four. Hebrew chapter, uh, chapter four, verse number four. For in one place, it speaks about the seventh day as follows. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Go ahead, go ahead. Let's read that. And again, in this place, it says, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains open for some to enter it and those who formerly received the good news fail to enter because of disobedience. Yes, again, go on, go on. again, he sets a certain day today, saying through David much later in the words already quoted. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not speak later about another day. So then, a Sabbath rest remains for the people of God. So brothers and sisters, up to this verse from 4 to 9 that we just read, it's all talking about the Sabbath day. It's all talking about the Sabbath rest. In the Old Testament, there was a day, uh, you know, they were told to work for six days and they were told to keep the seventh day as the Sabbath rest. So although they were allowed to work for six days, God told them, if other people are working, that's fine for them. They will be able to earn more, whatever. But when it comes to you who have a covenant with me, 
the seventh day is a day of rest it's a day dedicated to me and when you rest on that day it is a sign of your honoring me because i need to come into your life i need you to spend that one day so that that rest that you're going to get away from all your physical you know your labor you're going to use that time to dedicate it to me to dedicate in order to know that i am your god i am your source i am your everything so that was a way for the lord to remind the people of israel that out of the seven days one day had to be the day of rest let's go to verse number 10 for those who enter god's rest also cease from their labors as god did from his now listen to this my brothers and sisters i want to do some explanation here we really needs an explanation for those who enter god's rest also cease from their labors as god did from his you know you know i just mentioned to you in earlier in verse number 3 that god rested did god rest you know this verse reveals to us that this rest what the writer is saying is is you know what is he speaking about you know it, it is ceasing from our works the way god did from the works after creation was all done as we saw in verse number uh, verse number 3 you know my brothers and sisters you know when god created the heavens and the earth he did it in a unique way as i said to you that many people have still not understood today you know he didn't just create plants he did not create just animals he did not create something and then you know he started you know to to start producing more and more every day he gave them this ability within him to multiply to procreate that means he doesn't have to make new plants as i said to you earlier in verse number 3 he doesn't have to make new animals he doesn't have to make new human beings they reproduce on their own you know the original thing that jesus god did at the time of creation was done in such a way by the lord that he has now been resting ever since the time of creation listen to this my brothers and sisters when god finished creating the heavens the earth the moon the stars he created man he created the animals in the garden of eden and he put adam and eve in the garden of eden ever since that god has not been doing any more work as far as creation is concerned because whatever he had to do he has already finished it he has put this ability in the plants he has put this ability in the animals he has put put this ability in the human beings in order to reproduce on their own and you know sister and brothers this is exactly what the old testament sabbath which we which we read in for a short while ago the the old testament sabbath was painting a picture of the old testament sabbath was only a type and a shadow of the new testament please understand the old testament was not the real testament i mean i have done a teaching on this earlier about few months ago between the old covenant and the new covenant and if you will go and listen to the stocks it will help you so much because you begin to understand what was the difference in the old covenant what is the difference in the new covenant you know my brothers and sisters it was not the reality itself the old covenant was not the real reality and the jews were commanded to take one day out of the seven days you know out of the seven days they were told to take an off on that one day and devote it to worshiping the lord as an act of faith that god was their only source you know my brothers just think about it you know if you if you look at in the natural world like today people are working seven days a week they are working 3 365 days some of them don't even get an off and you know in the natural this doesn't make any sense you know if somebody is working every day they would have more money because they will have you know the salary of 30 days they will have salary of 365 days they will have overtime they will have so much of more money with that but you know my brothers and sisters when god told them that they are not supposed to work that one day it would mean that you know they didn't have to work every day they if they didn't work every day they would not prosper as much as those who worked you know 30 days 365 days of the year you know but the way it, it, it you know the way god designed it was he wanted the people of israel to operate by faith he wanted them to express their obedience to the sabbath day which he had asked them to do and you know my brothers and sisters the moment the people of israel followed the sabbath day they followed that law of seven days by by working on six days and taking the seven days off they prospered more than the people who worked for seven days let me see this again you know when the people of israel followed god's law by taking working for 6 days and giving the 7 day and off 
the people of Israel actually prospered more than the people who worked for seven days or worked for 30 days. They were the ones who prospered. God was teaching them to rest in the Lord as their souls and not on their works, not on their efforts, not on their performance, not on their abilities. He simply wanted them to obey. And you know, my brothers and sisters, all of this picture that, you know, God was their source, not their hard work, not their own abilities, not their own intelligence, not their own wisdom, not their own degrees, not their own wealth, not their own cloud. He wanted them to, uh, he wanted the people of Israel to believe that he was their source. You know, we may work, my brothers and sisters, and sow our crops. But you know, my brothers and sisters, it is, the God, it is God himself who gives us the increase. And in the same way, in the New Testament, Jesus has done everything for us. He has finished everything for us on the cross. But he isn't saving people like, you know, healing people even today. Many people think God will give me a blessing. God is going to heal me. God is going to prosper me. That is finished. It is already done. We should never be looking to heaven for us to receive anything from heaven. We should only be able to look on the inside and see what Jesus has already finished for us on the cross. All we are doing, my brothers and sisters, is entering into what has already been provided for, what Jesus has already finished for us on the cross. And you know, those who think that they can, they have to act in a particular way or they have to act in a holy way to gain God's approval or gain God's acceptance, they are not resting on the finished works of Jesus. Please understand this. You know, we are talking about the word rest. Jesus has come to me and rest. Here in the book of Hebrews, we must understand that if you are trying to do something on your own performance, for example, you want to do 2,000 Hail Marys, you want to go to church every day, you want to spend two, three hours in the Blessed Sacrament, you want to do a certain amount of Bible reading, you want to do certain spiritual exercises because you want to impress God so that you can receive from God. You know, my brothers and sisters, you are not resting in the finished works of Jesus. Nothing that you can do can get God to give something to you. It's only what Jesus has already finished. Surely, you know, we need to live holy lives. Doesn't mean that because Jesus done, we just live on anything what we want. But we should be a fruit. You know, what we should, what we are doing, it should be a fruit and not a root of our relationship with the Lord. Many people think that because I'm praying, because I'm coming to Bible class, because I'm, I'm studying the word, because I'm doing all this thing and all these works, God is very happy with me. God is very pleased with me. And that's why I'm getting blessed. You know, my brothers and sisters, this is what the Old Testament Sabbath was a picture of. God had told them, you take that one day off. And when you take that one day off, now for the next six days that you're working, you will simply begin to get prosper. There is people who are working for seven days. They will not be as prosperous as you because you are trusting in me. You're putting your faith in me. And you know, you know my brothers and sisters, even today, those who are legalistically observing the Sabbath day with the belief that God will be angry with them. Those who are, you know, the thinking that they have to, you know, if, if you don't go to church, you don't pray, do your prayers, you don't have a relationship with the Lord, you don't read your Bible, you don't come to Bible. People think that they are going to be missing something because they have missed the Sabbath day. You know, my brothers and sisters, if you think that you're missing something just because you do not go to church, you never come to Bible day, please understand one thing. The true Sabbath keeper in the New Testament are those who don't try to relate to God by their own holiness, but they are totally relying on what Jesus has already done for them. And that makes them acceptable to Jesus. Think about it, my brothers. A person, there are two people. One person is praying. One person is fasting, doing reading the Bible, doing lots of spiritual exercises. But the other person is simply believing the word, going about life, doing what they have to do. I tell you, the person who's stepping out is far more prosperous, is far more, you know, going to be successful because that person has already having a relationship with the Lord. He already knows the word and therefore he's putting that word into practice. That is a relationship to be enjoyed every moment. Please understand my brothers and sisters, our life with God is all about a relationship every single moment, every day of our life, and not just for a single day of the week. You know, you know, you know, my brothers and sisters, let me put it this way. The moment we begin to relate to God based on what we are doing, 
we are actually telling God, look at me, God, what a holy person I am. I go to Bible studies. I plan myself the whole day. I get up in the morning. I get up at three in the morning. I do about two, three hours of prayer. I go and listen to the Holy Mass online. I do so many things. You have to give it to me. You have to bless me. You have actually disqualified yourself. But the moment you begin to understand the word and do what the word says, you may not be spending too much of time with the Bible or spending too much of time in prayer. Although I don't say that you should not do that either. But you know, my brothers and sisters, when you have a relationship with somebody, when you really love the Lord, it won't become a burden for you that you have to do. You will do it with a, with a generous heart. You'll do it because you love the Lord. And therefore, brothers and sisters, our whole relationship in the new covenant is not about what we do. It's about a relationship that we have with this God. His love simply attracts us to come to the word, to listen to his voice, to be taught by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Let us go to verse number 11. Hebrew chapter 4, uh, verse number 11. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one may fall through such disobedience as yours. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one may fall through such disobedience as theirs. Who's this theirs? It is talking about the people in the Old Testament, the people of the, the Jews who were moving from, the, from, from Egypt to the promised land. They were absolutely disobedient. So here the writer of Hebrews is saying, let us therefore, because of what we saw in the previous verses, that we are supposed to take rest not based on our own effort, but by keeping our focus on the finished works of Jesus. He's saying, therefore, because you are taking that rest, make every effort to enter the rest. What, you know, brothers and sisters, why we must make every effort to enter that rest? That's exactly what this verse is saying. He's saying, make every effort to enter that rest. Why should we make every effort to enter the rest? You know, if we understood clearly what the rest of the Lord is, we saw in, you know, the previous verse number 10, then it takes effort to rest in the finished works of Jesus. It takes effort, my brothers and sisters. It takes labor on our part to enter into the uh, finished works of Jesus. You know, you know, my brothers and sisters, you know, our human attitude, our human nature always wants us to do something to be worthy of the Lord's blessing. I, I, I'm sure I was one time like that. I believe that I must do something. I must go to church. I must serve. I must pray. I must fast. I must do certain things so that God is going to bless me. You know, sister and brothers, our human natures want to do something to be worthy of the Lord's blessing. But the truth is that we can never, ever deserve the goodness of the Lord. We can never. We are not qualified to receive the goodness of the Lord. We have to cease from trusting in our own works and rest in what Jesus has done for us, which he can truly, which he freely gives us by his grace and grace alone. And what is the grace of God? The promise of God, the word of God. You know, you know, my brothers and sisters, if you can understand that by believing the word of God, what Jesus has already finished, you can receive it, then we will stop performing. We will try to do things with our own performance, with our own holiness. It takes effort, my brothers and sisters, to operate by grace and not to operate by works. Because if you do something, yes, we, are, we have done it. So we can say, yes, I have done it. That's why God has blessed me. You know, it will be the hardest thing we have ever done to quit relating to God on the basis of our own works and start totally trusting the Lord and trusting what Jesus did for you and me. We have to rest and we have to labor to that rest. And this is exactly why it is completely different to us laboring in order to get God to move or do anything new. You know, my brother says, you don't need to do anything. You simply need to believe the word. You simply need to know what Jesus has already accomplished on the cross. You simply need to receive to the finished works of Jesus. And when you believe that, you believe what Jesus has done and act according to what he has finished, that's the time you truly can experience the rest. You can experience everything that Jesus has already finished for us on the cross. Amen? Let us go to Matthew chapter 11, verse number 29. Let's go to our next verse. We went to Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Let us go to Matthew chapter 11, verse number 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle 
and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You know, you know, my brothers and sisters, we must understand that Jesus is God. The word of God tells us in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Jesus is God. The word of God is, is, is God itself. You know, when we look at the word of God in our Bible, we sometimes think, oh, it's the word of God. It's some printed words in the Bible. Please understand. The word is God. Jesus is God because the word became flesh. And you know, sisters and brothers, at the name of Jesus, everyone and everything with a knee will bow and confess him as Lord. They will confess him as the Lord of heaven. And Philippians chapter 2 verses, uh, uh, verses uh, I think, 10 to 11. You know, it says that the, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And you know, my brothers and sisters, yet this Jesus, yet this Jesus was God, yet this Jesus was Lord, yet this Jesus was Messiah, yet this Jesus was the Savior. This very Jesus, he's gentle and he's humble in heart. Isn't that awesome, my brothers and sisters? Isn't it awesome that a creator of heaven and earth is simply gentle and humble in heart? What a statement that the, uh, St. Paul writes in the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 to 11. Can we read that, please? You know, when you think about the word Jesus being gentle and humble in heart, in spite of knowing that he's the creator, he's God Almighty, he is the Messiah, he is the one who shed his blood, spotless, sinless, yet he came for you and me. And the word of God tells us he is gentle and humble in heart. Let's read that. Philippians 2 verses 10 and 11. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So very clear there in verses 10 and 11, that the name of Jesus Every knee shall bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And yet, my brothers and sisters, Jesus says to us in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, I am gentle and humble in heart. You know, you know, my brothers and sisters, you know, you know I'm just reflecting on this. You know, if, if you and I had to be God and we had to come to earth to save mankind as human beings, you know what we would have done? We would have come in our great majesty. We would have come like, you know, big Lord Falklands on this earth. But Jesus came humbly announcing his birth to shepherds instead of announcing to King Herod, announcing to the emperor, announcing to all the VIPs, announcing to the Pharisees, announcing to the chief priests that he had come on this earth to save them. He comes and announces only to the lowly shepherds who were looking after their sheep. In the, in, in, you know, that's mentioned to us in the Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 14. You're not going to read that. But in Luke chapter 2, even the angels came announcing to the shepherds that the, that, the, um, that the Messiah was supposed to come. There was a little child that was going to be born in Bethlehem. Again, if you and I had to be God, we would have done something very spectacular. You know, that's the human tendency. We want to be like, you know, we've got that show of business in us. We want to show up. We want to show what we really have. And he would have, and you know, we were there, we would have probably tried to do something very spectacular. But look at what Jesus, what happens to Jesus. You know, Jesus is born in the most humblest of, uh, uh, of circumstances. You know, my brothers and sisters, we would have been born probably into Caesar's palace or in, into someone of might and power. But Jesus was born to a young maiden who was engaged to a carpenter whose name is Joseph. Can you imagine? He's born to a maiden whose name is Mary from Nazareth, who was a virgin. She was going to get married to a company. Very simple people. Nobody would have even known what this, like everybody getting married, there would have been a Mary getting married to a carpenter, another marriage, another uh, ritual that was over, and nobody would ever know. But Jesus is born in that family of Joseph and Mary. 
Again, if you and I would have been probably, you know, Jesus, the Messiah, what we would have done, we would have proclaimed our word to everybody and enrolled everyone who would sing our praises. You know, today when you talk about preachers, they always want to tell, you know, how, how big their ministry is, how many people are working for them, what people are doing all this time. And, you know, if we were of those type, we would have told everybody, you know, see what a great preacher I am, or what a great leader I am, what a great person I am. Look at the amount of impact that I'm creating. You know, my brothers and sisters, we would have been also having people who really support us and would sing our praises that we are doing such great job. But look at Jesus. Jesus, actually, when he healed the people, he healed all those people of miraculously. Actually, he would tell them, don't go and tell anybody. We read that in Matthew chapter 9. You know, he had healed somebody. He had healed the leper. He says, go your way. Don't tell anybody. Go and show yourself to the high priest. Again, if you and I would have been probably the ones who were the Messiah, you know, if we were probably had gone through the cross and we had been raised from the dead, considering all those uh, people, those Roman soldiers, those Pharisees, those scribes, Pilate, Herod, they had all, you know, judged Jesus and sent him to the cross. Now that Jesus is, you know, risen from the dead, what would you and I have done? Would have probably, you know, been flying over Jerusalem and after our resurrection would have been telling everybody, look at me. You kill me, no? I'm already flying over Jerusalem. But you know, sister and brothers, there is not a single recorded instance where Jesus appeared to anybody other than those who believed in him. Please understand, Jesus did not appear to everybody. He only appeared after his resurrection to people who believed in him. Again, after Jesus is born, uh, risen from the dead, he would, he's not going to force you and me to acknowledge him as, as our God. He's not like that. He's not somebody who's going to stay with a stick. He's going to stay with a gun. He's going to point it at your head and say, now that I've risen for you, now that I died for you, you must believe in me. Look at the price I paid for you. You know, every parent will say to their children, look at the sacrifice I've done for you. I spent sleepless nights. When you were born, I, I went through so much of problem at your delivery. And look at the sacrifice I've done to raise you up. And now you're treating me like this? Do you think it's worth it? Do you not realize I'm your mother? Don't you realize I'm your father? But look at Jesus. He goes to the cross. He dies for you and me. And he doesn't stay with a stick and doesn't open his mouth and say, I died for you. You have to acknowledge me. You have to do something for me. You don't see anything of this sort in the Bible. Again, my brothers and sisters, Jesus could have simply, you know, written our names and given his instructions for our lives with every cloud that was passing by, but he's not going to do that. He could probably have the birds sitting on our shoulders and he could speak to the, to the let the birds speak in our ears, but he won't do that. He could probably come and speak to us in an audible voice, just like he heard the father's voice at the, at the baptism of, of, you know, plus at the transfiguration. But here is the point, my brothers and sisters, that I want to make. Jesus is simply gentle and humble in heart. He reveals himself in a very subtle way. He's not going to reveal himself in some big splendor to you and me. Many people are looking for the spectacular. Many people of this world who belong to this world, they always want to have the spectacular show. They always want to show, you know, what a spectacular, you know, person I am, what a spectacular ministry I'm doing, what a spectacular leader I am. You know, my brothers and sisters, it takes faith to recognize the Lord because that's the only way it pleases him. Let me say this again. You know, the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, verse number six, it says to us that the only way for you and me to please the Lord is by faith and faith alone. Remember, you know, if you really want to do it God's way, you really want to please the Lord. Don't try to do it with your own spectacular effort. Don't try to do it in your own way. The only way to recognize the Lord, the only way to really receive from the Lord is by faith and faith alone. That's what it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse six. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's what it says. Without faith, it is impossible to please the Lord. You know, my brothers and sisters, those who are looking only for the spectacular, those who are looking for big, you know, miracles, signs and wonders, until, you know, they get the lottery, until they see that their cancer has gone from their body, until they see that, you know, their marriage has been restored, unless they see something drastically happen in their life, they are going to wait. They are going to definitely miss God. You know, God is not going to reveal himself only when the miracle comes. You have to recognize God even in the midst of your storm. You need to recognize God even in the midst of your problems. You need to recognize God because he's continuously talking to us 
even in the midst of our circumstances and situation, you know, my brothers and sisters, we must understand that this rest that, you know, that Jesus is talking about in, in uh, Matthew 11 verse 29 is not rest for our spirits. It is the rest in our souls. Please understand. You know, when Jesus says, I will give you rest for your, for your soul, that's exactly what he says. You will find rest for your souls. You know, you know, my brothers and sisters, our born again spirit is already at rest. The day we accepted Christ, the day we were born again, the day we made Jesus our Lord, God and Savior, our spirit, which is, which is the real part of us, is already at rest. And any disturbance, you know, my brothers and sisters, in our lives is always taking place in our soul or it is taking place in our body. It never takes place in our, in our, in our spirit. Our born again spirit is absolutely at rest. Christ lives on the inside of us. Jesus gives us rest to our souls as well as to our spirits. Because on the day we accept Christ, he first and foremost gives us rest in our spirit. We become brand new. He's already on the inside of us. But now he's talking about getting rest in our souls, getting rest in our, in our, in our mind. Because the soul is the mind in our thinking, in our emotions, in our feeling, in our decision making. If we are able to focus on God's word, we are able to keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You know, my brothers and sisters, the peace and the rest and everything that is already in our spirit, we will also begin to experience that rest in our mind, in our soul, in our thinking, in our emotion. And once the mind is at rest, I tell you, my brothers and sisters, let me, let me give you a, a simple thing. You know, there could be a person who's sleeping for three, four days. You know, he's got no work to do. If that person's mind is not at rest, he can lie in the bed as much as he wants, but he will never rest. But a person who's rested in the mind, who's on the promises of God, within two, three hours, he will definitely be at rest. He will take a little sleep for a few hours, but he'll be able to go for a much longer time because when the mind is at rest, that person's body can take over for much longer durations. You can go without sleep for hours and days together. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. When our mind is at rest, when our mind is rested on the promise of God, we will not be complaining that, you know, I have not slept for eight hours. I have not slept for 10 hours. Even sometimes you will sleep for 10, 15 minutes. You will take a power nap and you will be so refreshed because that little rest that you got will give you enough, you know, battery charge to go on because first and foremost, your mind is at rest. And a rested mind, my brothers and sisters, has the ability to go beyond the physical. It has got the ability to go beyond the natural. It has got an ability to go into the supernatural. And the mind is at rest. It can take this body and use this body much beyond its capabilities in the natural. That's exactly what Jesus is saying. When our minds are at rest, they can only be rested in him. And that's all we are learning today. So in this particular verse, he's saying, take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon you. What is the yoke, my brothers and sisters, Jesus is talking about? What is this yoke? You know, if you understand, you know, those of you who basically are in from the rural areas or you have been growing up in the villages, not the people who are in the cities, they wouldn't understand what a yoke is. You know, a yoke is made of, of wood and it has got, you know, two hallowed out, uh, you know, some two hallowed out sections on the bottom. You know, that bottom portion is it's two hallowed uh, sections that rests on the necks of the oxen that are used to plow or to draw the cart. You know, the, 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 the oxen is always, the yoke is always put on the oxen so that the oxen is going to be used as the, as like the motor or like the car to drive whatever the cart is or whether to do the plying. And therefore, brothers and sisters, a yoke actually signifies service or it signifies submission. That's exactly, the, the oxen is supposed to submit to the master. The oxen is supposed to be, you know, controlled by the master who's put the yoke on him so that the oxen cannot play around and do whatever he wants. He has to be, he has, he's controlled in order to do that job. And Jesus was admonishing us to submit ourselves to him. That's exactly what he's saying in this verse. We must submit ourselves to Jesus for the true rest comes only by serving him and not serving ourselves. Let me say this again, my brothers and sisters. You know, if you really want to receive the rest from Jesus, we must submit ourselves to him. We must, you know, serve him by believing his word, by doing what his word says. And only when we do that, when we submit to the word, 
that's the time we are going to experience the true rest. So how does this practically work? Some of you will say, okay, I understand the yoke. I understand, you know, putting the oxen on the, on the bulls. I can understand when you put the oxen and you put some chain onto a cart or put to a pulley and automatically that will drive. I understand that. So how does it practically takes place? You know, my brothers and sisters, let me give you this, this sort of a illustration. You know, during the time, when, whenever they are going to use oxen, they always use a, a, a new ox, which was often not trained, and they put it along with, a, with an ox, which is already a well-trained ox, who's a much experienced ox, which they use for, you know, plowing the field or for drawing the carts or whatever. And, you know, the oxen is kept on the young ox for doing not so that the oxen will not do his own thing because the old oxen has already come to submission he has learned how to use the plow he knows that he has to do the job but the new ox the very stubborn ox he will not listen so what happens when the new ox and the old ox are put together the new ox learns to obey its master please understand it's a it's a way that this ox who's new and this ox who's experienced who are put together with that one yoke which is joining them both now, because this old ox is a very obedient ox, he's a, he's, he has learned to obey his master, the new York now learns to submit. In the same way, my brothers, brothers and sisters, we are to commit ourselves to being yoked to Jesus. That's exactly what it means. We must train ourselves to bear the yoke in our youth if we want to, you know, become more mature Christians. You know, you know think about it, my brothers and sisters. You know, when, when we talk about the youth, the youth are always rebellious. You know, they grow, you know, during the time of their teenage life. There are a lot of changes that are taking place in their bodies. Their hormones are changing. They are growing up, you know, in, in maturity, in their physically, in their mentally. And therefore, this world offers so much of, uh, you know, challenges, offers so much of temptation that they begin to fall because of all the temptation the world offers. And that's the reason why, my brothers and sisters, we as parents have got a responsibility to introduce the word of God to our children at a very early age. You know, if we have just left our children without, you know, the word of God, and then when they have gone astray, you try to bring them, then you will be praying, you will be fasting, you will be doing spiritual exercises, then you'll probably call the priest, you'll call the preacher and say, my son is not listening, my daughter is not listening, they have gone astray. It is important for us in our youth to train them in such a way that they now become mature Christians as they grow when they are yoked to Jesus. That's exactly what we need to learn. And you know, my brothers and sisters, in the comparison about the yoke is up to this point when it becomes, when it comes to the yoke. But unlike the, you know, the harsh treatment that the old, that the, uh, you know, the new ox receives to bring it into submission, Jesus, on the other hand, is simply gentle and humble in heart. You know, you know, my brothers and sisters, the, the, the example of the yoke, yoke is good to a point as far as the yoke is concerned for us to learn discipline. But when it comes to Jesus, when we are yoked to Jesus, Jesus is not a harsh God. He's not a master who's staying with a stick and beating us up. Because, you know, when, when the new ox is put along with the old ox, you must understand that the new ox gets beaten by the master. He gets solid wax on him so that he learns to obey. He doesn't like to become stubborn and moves his own path because he has to align himself to the old ox. But when it comes to Jesus, Jesus is simply gentle and humble in heart. And he wins us only by love. You know, my brothers and sisters, just think about it. When you come to the word of God, Jesus is not coming to us and he's saying, you have to do it. I went to the cross. I died for you. You must listen to me. He's simply drawing us. He's simply attracting us by love and love alone. That's what it says in 1 John chapter 4. Verses 11. 1 John chapter 4, verses 11, and I believe verse number 19. Can we read that, please? First book of John, chapter 4, verse number 11. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. How can we love one another, my brothers and sisters? We can only love with the love we have received from Jesus. We can only love others even though they are not lovable because we have received something from God and that love of God enables us to love others with an agape love, with a God kind of love. Let's go to verse number 19 and see what, what that verse number 19 says. 
we love because he first loved us he we love because he first loved us you know my sister but as many of us think that we love god we are praying we are coming to the bible study we are fasting we are going to church we are going to online mass we are fasting we are praying we are doing the rosary we are doing a lot of spiritual exercises but when you look at verse number 19 all that we do simply drops like a little stone on the ground because we can only love because we have received the love of god we love because god loved us first he gave his son for us when we understand by believing in the sacrifice of jesus that love of god is poured into our hearts by the holy spirit john uh, roman chapter 5 verse 5 so when we are born again we receive the gift of the holy spirit we receive the free gift of the holy spirit and now that we receive the gift of the holy spirit the love of god gets poured into our heart by the holy spirit that's what he says and hope does not disappoint us because god's love has been poured into our hearts through the holy spirit that has been given to us you know my brothers and sisters please understand this you know when we talk about the yoke and you talk about the yoke being yoked to jesus you know when just to give you an example of this illustration of a new ox and an old ox when it comes to the new ox the new ox has to be taught to submit along with the old ox by his master by the beating and all that but when we yoke ourselves to the word of god because we love the word we love jesus we have experienced his love jesus pulls more than his share of the load that we are bearing therefore our burden becomes light and we just move on to what exactly jesus says in the next verse number 30 our burden becomes simply light you know my brothers and sisters our burden cannot become light if we are not going to be connected to the lord only when we yoke ourselves to his word when we believe what his word says then only our burden is going to become light exactly what that verse says in in matthew chapter 11 verse number 30 let us go to our last verse for today matthew chapter 11 verse number 30 for my yoke is easy and my burden is light jesus is saying for my yoke is easy and my burden is light you know my brothers and sisters you know when i'm just going to speak about my own self you know when it comes to when i was serving the lord before i really knew the word before i really had a relationship before before, before i really came to a relation i was more of a religious person i went to church every day went to mass every day i was serving in the church i had all the titles in the church except the parish priest so you know i was serving the lord but you know what at the end of serving the lord i used to think oh my i'm really serving that's why god is very happy with me and there were times you know with so much of pressure of you know serving in the church with so many things to do i used to think sometimes serving god is extremely tough i used to really think serving god is extremely tough you have to meet so much of level of service so that god will be pleased with you you know my friends and sisters serving god is not tough serving god is impossible If you really want to serve God, it is impossible. Well, why I would say it is impossible? Well, if we serve Jesus in spirit and in truth, it's easy and His burden is light. You know, you know, you know, my brothers and sisters, I'm going to, I'm going to really share with you something which is so personal to my, to my change and to my conversion. You know, I have served in the church. I've served with the Lord. We did a great job, my wife and myself, serving in different capacities in the church. and sometimes because the service is to be so much we literally used to complain because you say how many things we are being dumped into how many things we are doing and we used to think that it's really serving the lord is a really tough business but anyway we will do it because we are going to get blessed by it you know sister and brothers if we only can serve the lord in spirit and in truth it is going to be extremely easy it's and the burden is going to be light you know even when the times are when we are going through our tough even when you're going to tough times jesus carries our load for us that's what it says in 1 peter chapter 5 verse number 7 cast all your cares unto the lord because he cares for you that's exactly what our god is you know my brothers and sisters you know when you want to serve the lord with your own strength with your own ability with your own talent with your own resources with your own just because i'm going to serve the lord you know by the time you actually come to serve the lord and serve the people you will be like a real dead duck you will be literally you know by the time people see you they will not see christ in you they will see a person who's completely drained completely washed out and literally you know they will think what is this person doing 
And that's exactly what my situation was. We were so bogged down with serving that we thought, you know, we'll serve anyway because we are going to get blessed by the Lord. But actually speaking, within us, we were tired. We just were doing it to please the authorities, please the, uh, the parish priests. We were just doing it, you know, so that everybody would give us a pat on the back and the time when it was, the pat was required. And you know, my brothers and sisters, we simply never learned to, you know, cast our cares onto the Lord. And if we were burdened down under the life's boat loads, my brothers and sisters, it's a simple indication we are not resting in Jesus, but we are resting in our own selves. We are resting in our own abilities. Let me say this again. If we are right now burdened down under life's load, we think, oh my goodness me, when will all this problem end? When will my marriage get fixed? When will that financial problem get in? When will this sickness leave my body? You know, if we are constantly thinking about what we are carrying right now as a real heavy burden, we think that, you know, we are called to carry our cross and that's why we are carrying this cross. Please don't carry this cross. Transfer it onto Jesus. He cares for you and me. He has already finished it for you and me on the cross. And therefore, brothers and sisters, when we begin to understand that Jesus has already done it all for us on the cross, let us rest in his promises. Let us rest in his word. Let us rest in the grace of God. The word of God is the grace of God. And when we understand that it is all finished, we can believe what God has done through Jesus. We will be in perfect rest in spite of all the problems we are going through because we have put all our cares onto the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for teaching us today what it means to really be at rest. Rest in our mind, just relying on you and your promises. Lord, you also taught us, Lord, today how you are so humble of heart, despite that you, you were the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You came as that little babe to save us and save the whole world. You humbled yourself unto death, death on the cross. Today, Lord, help us to be humble, humble just to rely on you, to depend on you in everything. Lord, whether it is our service, whether it is in the problems that we face, whether it is in our relationships with one another, help us, Lord, to always look at you. Look at your example of being meek and humble of heart and draw strength from you as we rest in you, Lord, and in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.